<laughs> well, I sure didn't prepare because I'm just, you know, in my. Oh, I prepared. I'm wearing my dress Frankspurg boots t shirt. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Looks great to me. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming on with me today. I know you guys are swamped as heck over there. Um, and I know Frank's about to take off next month to uh, go meet up with the wildland firefighters and all that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on my channel today. I'm joined today with Frank Petrelli, owner and founder of Frank's Boots. He's also former co-owner of Nick's Boots. Is that correct too? Yes. Okay. Trying to get the story straight. I was reading the stitch down article and trying to get all the all the pieces together, but we could get into that, you know, in a minute. But Frank, so Frank and Michelle, thank you so much for coming on with me today. Thanks for having us today. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys are pretty swamped right now, huh? Oh yeah, I'm yeah. still trying to recover from all the sales. So you guys got a lot of sales, a lot of a lot of. Yeah, business is good. We're we're uh, we're moving right along. Production is flowing very well, and and sales are good. So we're happy. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that as well. So real quick, uh, so I was reading Ben's article, Stitch Down's article on you guys. He did a very good job, by the way. Um, I'll leave a link to that article in, in the uh, description below. You know, reading through it earlier, I was just trying to suss out the details. I know I didn't get everything exactly right in my original video, and I do have footage for another video I'm going to be releasing uh, on your boots here soon. It's uh, actually my friend Michael Smith. Uh, shout out to shout out to Mike. Yeah, he he had me photograph his, I, I believe they're golf green. Yeah. 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 yeah a absolutely crazy awesome uh, I think Dublin golf green okay okay yeah I have a picture of Mike's yeah yeah, yeah. so that started out as the Dublin golf green and then I believe we rebuilt those with the Montana green uh bison oh okay interesting that's a killer pair right there yeah Mike's got a couple few pair <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a super cool guy. I actually had him on for a boot talk. Uh, I watched it. Yeah. Oh, did you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. He does a great interview. Yeah, he does. He's so smart. Wow. Like, he he blows me away every every time I talk to him. I'm like, wow, this this guy is. He's got a very high IQ. He runs circles around me. That's for sure. I love talking to him because it's like talking to my son. My son is a techie. He's an IT. Works for Google. So when I get Michael on the phone, I I kind of have that that you know warm fuzzy like I'm talking to my son. He's a great kid. Yeah, yeah, he definitely is. He, yeah, he's he's the one that linked us up, uh, I believe. And then and then our uh, mutual friend Mario as well. He yeah. Mario, the one who had me. He sent me, had the Steel Predators sent to me so I could get a look at those too those that was a killer build as well yeah, you did so, great you. oh thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was my pleasure it was my first time getting to getting to get a look at your guys's stuff you know in person so so real quick I just kind of wanted to do like a recap of like how how you guys got started because I know that so you were with Nick's Boots for about what 20 years yeah okay and then you took a break for about six months and then uh you said, okay, it's time to do this again, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So the, the long story short is when we sold Nick's Boots, we sold it in 2013, my partner and I. And I worked for the new owner for two and a half years. Um, and it was good. It was really good. But he started moving a little bit in a little bit different direction than, than I was used to. So I did leave in January of 2016. And... I took six months off and wanted to figure out what I wanted to do when I grow up. But I, so I thought that I was going to be out of boots for um, the rest of my life. I thought I was going to go do something different. I was 54 years old. After a little bit of time, you know, once you're in it, you just, it gets ingrained within you. So I would find myself standing in line at a bank or a grocery store, studying feet and boots again with the people around me. And I started to miss it. What I really started to miss was the interaction with the customers, the interaction with the employees and building a boot and customizing a boot that changes a person's life. Not only does it look good on their feet, but, but the way this boot balances your body weight, it, it can change people's lives as far as the way they feel at the end of the day. Sometimes if they start out the day in pain and they put the boots on, it can subside. Or at the end of a day, if they are in 
extreme pain with other footwear, but then they try ours. The testimonials that we receive from the majority of our customers is what keeps us going. Wow. Because the boot business is not an easy one. It's very difficult. It's, you can learn something new every day. I've got a total of 29 years in it now, but um, I, I know a lot. I know a little about a lot and I know a lot about a little. And if without my team, I mean, they, these, this crew is, is fabulous. Without them, we're nothing because cumulatively they know the, uh, they've got the in depth and we can get through anything. So getting back to the story, I left for six months and then uh, the owner of Nick's boots moved out of my building and uh, we have a, you know, it's a pretty old building here on market street, but I've been in it since 1991. And then, and Frank, uh, Nick's boots was in it from 91 all the way till 2016. And wow. I was up here one night. It was probably 11 or 12 o'clock at night. I was cleaning the building out and I found a knife and it's called a lip knife. And I picked okay. up the lip knife and I looked around and I said, you know, I'm going to think I want to open another boot company. So I That's came what home. I said, you're crazy. Yeah, I came <laughs> home. She was sitting on the couch and I said, I had this look on my face. I was probably wild eyed. And she looks at me and she goes, what's the matter? And I said, well, you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but. I think I want to open another boot company. Well, almost got divorced in that minute. <laughs> but no, she was on. She was on board. You know, a little. It, it, it a was little reluctant. A little I reluctant. Must say. Starting a brand at 54 yeah. years old, starting over. Uh, we had a few things going for us. I had my shop foreman and I, who had worked together for over 20 years. He came back with me, a couple of my old, older guys that had worked for me at Nick's that weren't working for Nick's at the time came back and everybody was on board. And wow, before you know it, we're all in eight years later. Um, we're still here and doing a great job. And again, it's my team that is, is the, everybody combined. Is, it's just fantastic. That is so inspiring. And I, I love that story for so many reasons. Maybe because, you know, like me too, I'm, I'm not a boot maker at all. I'm just a boot buyer and lover. <laughs> I can so, see it. And, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He's just missing the pair of Franks right <laughs> yeah. behind him. I am missing Franks. <laughs> I do have some dicks here and some, some whites we can talk about. Great are, boots. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah we, we can talk about that. But I've, uh, I've recently started doing my own mini leather work in in my shop here. I, I just started on belts this week. Nice. So beautiful. Yeah. This, yeah. Thank you. Belts this are fun is, uh, to make. Yeah, they are. They're so easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hardly anything to it, you know. What um, leather is that? This is uh, Wicked Craig Russet. Russet Bridal. harness. Oh, Russet Bridal. Oh, yeah. Bridal. Bridal. Okay. Yeah. See, I think it's about 10 ounces, eight and a half ounces. I prefer my belts to be more like about 10 ounces, but it's close. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks good. looks real good. Thank you. Yeah. And you yeah, do, gotta... tell me what else you do. You do false tongues and yeah, yeah, I do, soft uh, liners and. Yeah, I do chill tees and I do, uh, yeah, I can grab some of these. Yeah, yeah, let me see. All right, so here are some of my. Tees in a, this is Sidell's British Tan Double Shot. Beautiful. I love that leather. Yeah, oh yeah, I love, I'm a huge fan of Double Shot. Yeah. That's, Very nice. Thank you, thank you. And then, uh, yeah, I started making uh, insoles as well. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, I have sizes 40 to 48, so uh, not, not super well stacked on sizes yet. Right. But. Yeah, I just have a, uh, it's a Weaver Master Press. Uh, Your story reminded me so much of mine. I can reflect on it because it's like, you no, know, I'm not a boot maker, but I, if I go too long without getting my hands on leather or making stuff out of leather, I start to miss it like a lot. Like I feel like it's something in my DNA that makes me drawn to it. You know what I mean? Like I can't get away from it. So, and, and I love to talk to people who, do it as well because I, you know, I love to pick their brains. It, it, it truly some of the most thoughtful and smartest people I've ever met in my life. So that's another reason why 
I'm super appreciative that you guys took some time today to talk to me. So, well, once you once you start working with leather, it's it, it just it grabs you and it pulls you in, um, yeah. it, and you can't get away from it. It it is fun in every way. Yes, it really is, and uh, and part of the reason why you started Frank's was because you didn't like to be in that factory line. You know, yeah. you didn't want to. Be on a you know on a production line you wanted to have creative license yeah i would say he he's very old school and so there were some ways where nix was starting to head into another direction which is a great one it worked it's obviously worked well for them but he's very old school and wanted to stick to the thickness of leather and the temper of leather that he was used to and didn't really want to move away from just doing it the old fashioned way because he felt like that was the best way uh, to get the longevity and durability out of a boot. So, um, Well, in the problem solving of a consumer that has had trouble finding boots to fit their whole life. Right. There, um, and I somehow or other, and it, maybe it comes from my construction background, it came to me, I wouldn't say easily, but I adapted to it pretty quickly early on, back in 94, 95. And to visually see what you, the shape of a foot and what you have to do to create that shape for the customer. Yeah. Uh, somehow I, I ended up with that ability. I, I, I really don't know how, but that's, that is something that I really enjoy doing. So um, we don't want to, we prefer not to be cookie cutter and yeah. uh, not that anybody else is. Everybody else builds a great handmade boot. It's Absolutely. just that we want to give some options. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that was, that was another question I wanted to ask. So, you know, being that uh, I, I talk to so many people who buy boots and I buy a lot of boots myself and things like that, foot tracings, right. how difficult is it? to size someone based off of foot tracings because i've seen a just so many nightmares like i have so many friends that they send in their foot tracings they get the boot it's way too small or they send it in they get the boot it's way too big like is is it difficult to build a boot based on foot tracings i imagine it's got to be next to impossible <laughs> so, yes. of guessing. yeah there there's a lot of interpretation yep. involved in it yep. um just keeping in mind, now I can do a drawing of my own, give all the okay. measurements and then give it to one of my guys to build the custom last or do the sizing off of. You're interpreting a lot. One of the things that the drawing doesn't give you is the circumference of the foot or the yeah, volume yeah. of the foot. So you have to do a measurement, tape yeah, measure yeah. settings all the way up. And those are normally wrong. When a, when a customer does it, eight to 10 out of 10 times yeah they're they're not correct so right. what we are doing is taking the formula that we know as, as height and weight of the person the shape of the foot the measurements they're giving us and really trying to create draw back on our long history of mistakes yeah. mm -hmm. and long history of successes and try okay, and read okay. between the lines. So yeah. one of one of our sayings is we can only build a boot as good as the drawing is. Yeah. Sometimes the drawing is not is is not up to par, and we we just can't make it happen because the customer can't get the drawing right. Yeah. But yeah. when they do, mm -hmm. um, and it happens often, 97 percent of the time, we can we can build a boot off a customer's drawing and it works and it works great. Okay. Step-by-step -step directions and we have a video and I'll still tell people you got to hold the pen straight up and down. You have to make sure you have somebody else trace your foot. Don't try to trace your own foot. And, you know, just uh, kind of those little important details. And some people will use a thick barrel pen as opposed to a thin barrel pen. So that can make a quarter of an inch difference all the way around. So, oh, yeah. Okay comical story once many many years ago because i set the program up for the fit sheet process at nick's boots many years ago and oh, okay. there was one i almost remember the couple's name but she drew her husband's foot without a sock on and she went in between each toe <laughs> and then for the toenails she drew a different smiley face and a frown face and a mad face and colored one red 
And she sent that to us and with a note at the bottom uh, laughing. And she said, the real fit sheet will be in in a day or two because we did two of them, one just to make us laugh. And, and that was fun. So sometimes you can have fun with the process. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And I do see that you build boots for people who are missing, you know, part of their foot or maybe have some other medical issue. Have you ever built boots for uh, conjoined twins? No, no, that's no. We haven't. <laughs> that is that is, that would be a new one for us. It's still going to be a left and a right. So yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, maybe three boots, like maybe a left boot, a right boot, and then like a a middle boot for the middle. Middle boot with a left and a right attached yeah. to the center. Hey, I'd be you know, willing to try. I'm I'm not afraid of trying anything. You know, I always say honestly, our our customer is so creative but yeah. we have the greatest crew and craftsmen and women that are able to keep up with whatever creativity our customer has and a lot of times you know i, I would bring it to my production manager and he's he can be a little rough around the edges and sometimes we'll be like what is this you're bringing me and then you know i bring it to another guy and they're like oh my god that's such a great idea let's try that like, like game on like challenge accepted they're really excited about trying something new and then eventually you know by the time we get around it and then it comes out it's like wow this is really a cool idea i'm so glad that we you know we pushed for it we really just we it, said yes it can be hard we get a lot of work injuries um yeah. job place injuries i have a um a few doctors that will send people to us locally and out of town um and you know that that is always a challenge um, because yeah, you're yeah. trying, not only you're trying to just wrap their foot, but often you're trying to, to take some body pain away at the same time, because if they've gotten a knee crushed or a leg crushed, we yeah, have to yeah. work with the doctor to try and figure out how much of a lift or uh, wrapping the foot is one thing, but then distributing the body weight, that's all mm -hmm. another ballgame. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love the heart that our craftsmen have too. We have uh, just recently had a gentleman who had a brace that was built into his boot, like it went through the heels and came up the side so that he didn't have to put a brace on in the morning. He just slipped his boot on and had the brace inside and attached from the outer part. And they just took so much care and love and yeah, I, I, just, I have to say that that is one of the most challenging is to make that work around the brace because the braces will create different heights when you're standing inside the boot. So now you have to adjust the other one to straighten the hips. So yeah. one, one of our biggest custom fit customer is getting their toes cut off with either we live in the Northwest. So it's either going to be a chainsaw. Uh, oh, yeah. Chainsaw or lawnmower. Oh, yeah. Um, very, very often, I've probably, I can't even tell you how many I've done over the years, people with missing a toe or three toes or no toes and cut the whole front off. Um, yeah. Usually with the lawnmower, it's because they're backing up, up an incline and yeah. pulling the mower backwards. And when they fall, they end up pulling it over them like a bed sheet and their toe goes underneath it. Um, chainsaws just, chainsaw accidents, are, there are many of them. There was one boot that I built for a customer who actually had a six toe on one foot. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I say and extra a, toes, missing toes, yeah. hammer toes. Yeah. You name it. Transplanted toes. Oh <laughs> God. You know, I mean, I I tell you, if I take you through his camera roll, it's so yeah. funny. You will see the it's like nothing but feet. <laughs> feet and boots you know um yeah you can tell what we do awesome. for a living that's a fact yeah yeah definitely definitely and uh, you know not to plug stitch down podcast too much but listening to the stitch down podcast he, ben had uh ron Ryder on i'm not sure if you guys know who he is he, no not off the top of my head okay i think he was an alden salesman for a while um but he said uh, that he feel, and this is in line with what you do. He said that he feels like there needs to be a certification course because he sees boots not as garments but as medical equipment. You know, yeah. because your your health, your alignment, your your structure, your bodily structure depends on the support that you're getting from your boot. And if it's missized, if it's too small, it can create all kinds of problems: ankle, knee problems, 
if it's too big, it's doing other stuff that's not good. Yeah, getting fit properly is actually crucial to your well, your overall well-being. You know, it's your boot that t- connects you to the earth. You know, your move. This is what you use to move around throughout. You know, in your in your life, this is it's more crucial uh, transportation, in my opinion, than your automobile. You know, your footwear is comes first, in my opinion. In a sense, it is medical equipment, and so I feel like what you guys are doing is in alignment with having health in mind, which is, I think, the correct approach when it comes to sizing people. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my mom always said, you know, spend your money on two things: yeah. your footwear and your bed, because if you're not in one, you're in the other. And so, you know, true. that just makes sense. And one of our guys um, who has been with Frank since the days of Nick's and he came in to get his uh, boots resold and we asked him, Hey, what, when did you get these? And he said, 2003. Wow. It had been literally 20 years since he had gotten a a resole on them. Um, I still have my first pair that I put on in 1992. They're actually still wearable. What? I could, I haven't worn them in a long time, but they are still wearable. Wow, that is awesome. What what are they? Just a pair of two, well, it was called the Ranger back then. So it's a two-tone Ranger that I built at Nick's Boots for myself. Oh, cool. That is so cool. Dang. Yeah, this stuff really does last forever if you want it to, you know. <laughs> Speaking of leather, um, I was reading that you, you source most of your leathers from Horween, Seidel, Wicket, and Craig. Do, do you source from any other tanneries? I think I saw you yeah. guys running some Marium, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, some so okay. we, we buy that. Um, uh, it's Marium Horsehide from Italy. Okay. Uh, so we have it in just a few different colors. And we kind of just bought it to test and see, yeah. you know, how it would run through production, how careful my guys had to be. And, you know, did they have to wear white gloves? Did they have to protect it in plastic bags? And yes, you do have to be super careful. And, you know, some of the machinery is 50 year old machinery that's meant to do, you know, hardcore work boots. So putting a nice, pretty dress leather in there sometimes can be a risk, but um, it's worked out really well. And I think, Frank sometimes looks at me and he's like, oh, geez, what'd you order now? But it's like, I go shopping, I see something pretty and I'm like, oh, we got to have that leather. But it's, it's fun. Um, She's the gatekeeper on the, on the uh, dressier exotic type leathers. I, I am such an old school brown, black, walnut work boot. Type. That, that's my love. Um, yep. She has really changed the company with, I guess I didn't have a choice because I didn't want to want to get into this side of the business, but <laughs> leather started showing up. So here we are. And yeah. she's doing a really good job with it. I, you guys I, are yin and yang then. That's awesome. You guys. Uh, yeah, well, we've been together since we were 14 years old. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. So we uh, have our little Frank's boot community and occasionally I'll post old photos of us and people will guess what year it was or how old we were. And yeah, it's kind of fun. But honestly, I, like I love to go to our community. I engage every night and try to see oh, wow. you know, who's, you know, come on, who's got questions about break in or just somebody who just posted a new boot that they got. And everyone is, is always so kind. And I mean, yeah. honestly, it, it is really my happy place to go to because the gentlemen are so nice to each other. And there's a few gals on there too, but there are people who post when they have a, a newborn baby and everybody's yeah. like, Hey, congratulations. Or somebody was posting that his wife was ill and there were so many people just offering prayer and love. And cool. I guess I feel so blessed to be a part of that community because yes. they really, they really bring their heart and their a game to it. There definitely is a, a very special kind of community. There's no yeah. bashing. Yeah. People are kind to one another and this has worked out really nicely. Yeah, that's so true. That's what keeps me engaged too. It is it is the people. I, I find that, pe- that people that are into boots and, and leather, they're some of the most interesting, you know, and it, it kind of makes sense psychologically. Like like if, if you're drawn aesthetically to a well-made thing, like a no, a no shit well-made thing, like, you know, the eye doesn't lie when it sees quality. If you're drawn to that, I think you might be part of a very, you know, a very small 
percentage of the population because you know most people you tell them you spent five seven hundred dollars on a pair of boots they think you're crazy they, they don't want to hear anything about it they you know they want to hear oh you know they want to hear you got your shoes at pay less or you know big lots or something like that they don't want to hear that you spent like <laughs> it's an education process and we have to do it in here you know one of the stories that i tell and it actually is a true story is a customer came in many years ago and when they came in the store and he said, I'm not going to spend that kind of money on my feet. And this is back when the boots were $400 yeah. or 350 And I looked outside and he was driving a 1972 Chevy pickup that he had <laughs> yeah. restored and he had, you know, two to $3,000 worth of tires and yeah. wheels on it. Wow. I got a little snarky and I said, well, so you're going to shoe your truck better than you are your own feet. Are you going to have that truck when you're 70 years old? I explained the distribution of body weight and how it's, you know, you buy, you buy once or you buy quality and it's going to last you two to three times longer. It's all amortized over the years. And he became one of our really good, um, uh, recurring customers so oh, cool. we do it every day we do that education process every day in this store because the people who don't understand that it's not just something wrapping your foot once you get a, a handmade boot that fits right with the right sock it's a game changer in life and and when yeah, we yeah. get through that explanation if you have somebody that's open to it mm -hmm. that's what we love Definitely. And I love that you're saying that it changes your life because it does. Like my first good boot that I ever had was in 2013. I think I bought my first pair of Aldens and uh, it was like stepping into a new dimension. You know, I, I tell the story all the time. It's like the first time I stepped into a boot or into a real shoe my in my, in my entire life. It was life changing. And uh, ever since then, I was just hooked. You know, it's it does change your life. <laughs> it, make, it makes your life better. You get to live in something that's really good quality now you don't have to live in something that's junk you know and why why would you want to what to save save a couple hundred bucks so you, can, you know live your life miserably like sorry I, that's for probably a lot of people most people out there but that's to me it's a no-brainer buying something that it's not only going to look good but it's going to give you that support. And I feel complete when I'm in a pair of boots. I put it on and I'm in my uniform. You know what I mean? I feel ready to tackle anything. I feel equipped, you know, fully equipped in a in a good pair of boots. And so I love the way that you guys philosophize about it because it's exactly how I see it. People think I'm crazy. So I'm glad to talk to somebody who can. Have people to back you up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, another quick story is uh, we were going to Disney World or Land, whichever one's in California, many, many years ago. And I had my my first pair of boots on and they were two tone in color. And when we were leaving, she wanted to know if we were going to I was going to go get another pair of tennis shoes because or sneakers, whatever you want to call them, because yeah, I'm going to be yeah. wearing shorts when we are in Disney World. And I said, <laughs> no, I'm going to I'm going to wear my boots with my shorts. OK, and at the end of that week, she was really happy because I yeah. was way less cranky. Oh, God. Yeah. If I had worn non-supportive shoes, we would have been out of Disneyland in, in a half a day, which is what my kids wanted to do. They were exhausted. But this one was dragging us from ride to ride to ride. Um, That's so fun. Yeah. But um, <laughs> well, and it made a huge difference. And Junior, my right hand man here in the store, goes once a year down with his kids and he wears his boots when he's walking through it too because cool. he understands the, you know, a couple hours on your feet with with non supportive footwear versus a couple hours of your feet with supportive footwear. Is totally yeah. different. Totally. I completely agree. And you know what, like it, it, I don't care if it looks ridiculous. I'm with you now. Like I adopted the boots and shorts thing, even in a pinch, I'll wear my boots with a bathing suit. Like I don't care. I'm comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, if you're not afraid to show your manliness with that yeah. pair of shorts and a pair of good looking boots, that's yeah. awesome. Hey, I'm 61 years old now. So if, if, if somebody doesn't like the way I look, they can just look the other way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so true. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Well, Frank did find that boot that was hand welted. Oh, okay. Hand welted? Yeah. Well, I have a sample of a half welted boot. So I can, when you're ready, I can explain my opinion of the difference between the two, or actually between yeah. the three okay. welted versus McKay stitched, Blake stitched, or none tell me yeah, when you're yeah. ready 
Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear your explanation in your breakdown of it. So the true Norwegian rolled well that that we have been doing for years and years and years with Nix. It's a great way of building boots. I love it. It's traditional. Some will say that it helps to conform the boot closer to the shape of the foot because the welt is done on the side. So that's one of the positives. The one, the biggest negative between welted boot, well, biggest negative of a welted boot is that when you're doing it, this is the welt. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. This is your vamp leather. It's folded over. When you look at this, this is the vamp leather that's folded underneath. Okay. And this is your welt. And the welt will lay on top here like this. Now, what yeah. is happening is you're you're poking a hole through the welt through the vamp leather and then actually right through the inner sole through that channel okay so over time after this is folded out and then you fold this out and then you double stitch that through the the uh, midsole everything gets stitched over time this stitch that you can see here mm -hmm. you can see that white stitch right there yeah might be a little hard to see but over time those stitches those holes can start to elongate and that can allow dirt and water into the interior of the boot and start to rot the insole as well as the, the vamp leather because you actually have a hole that's been you're penetrating the inner portion of the boot okay now, when you do a mckay stitch boot <laughs> picked up all my papers with it the mckay stitch is done through the insole all the way through the midsole and the leather liner is wrapped in between now the mckay well or the mckay stitch in my opinion is a actually a cleaner drier boot because everything is done in the interior some will say that it's a prob problematic stitch because some customers will feel that, that stitch okay. underneath their foot. The trick to it is to make sure that when you're making the stitch or when you are stitching it, that you're far enough on the outside. And if the tensions, tensions on your machine are set properly on your stitcher, it will uh, bury it within the midsole of the boot and, and you don't feel it. Right. It's only, it's only when the machine isn't your tension isn't set right or your stitch length isn't set right or it ends up under typically underneath the foot instead of on the outer edge of the foot that you'll feel it. And if that does happen and it has happened over the years occasionally and when I say occasionally for us it's always it has been very occasionally it hasn't happened all that much. There is a way that we can settle that stitch and it in a quick repair and it usually goes away now a non-stitched boot where it's just glue down glue down is glue down it's great glue holds until it does not and and yeah. at some point in time it can it can delaminate on the inside and i have taken boots apart where the insole is totally curled up and separated from the midsole of the boot, the liner has been moved. It's a great way of building boots. I just don't think it meets the level of a McKay or meets okay. the level of a welted boot. So there are three different levels. Sometimes I like to call it, you know, half ton, one ton, uh, three quarter ton, one ton. But if you go with the welted boot, you do have, especially in a work environment, if you're out in a lot of mud and dirt, uh, we did, we started our McCain boots back in, in the early 90s at Nick's Boots, and we did it because the farmers asked us to do it. There's various stories out there on why we went to a McKay boot. Like people will say that we decided to do it simply because we could call it a triple stitched boot. But it's not really the case. We, we did it because we found we had customers come to us and ask us to make a boot that didn't get dirt penetrated in between the midsole and the insole. And the McKay stitch will stop that. And like I said, you know, some will call it a redundant stitch. It is time consuming. And with two McKay stitch a boot, once you get the boot lasted and the, and the midsole put on, you have, to re, you have to unlace it and then you have to remove the last. You run the Blake stitch around. You have to put the last back in 
So that process in and of itself takes quite a bit of time. As long as the machines are available and as long as the thread is available, I will always McKay stitch boots. Um, I do, you know, I'll, I'll do all of the, all the manufacturing processes, but I really like the McKay stitch process. Wow. Very cool. All yeah. But the yeah. All but the Patriot. That's one of the difference with our Patriot boot. It's not yeah. McKay stitch. It's a glued down boot. Which is why we can offer it at a yeah. value fair price. Cause I was wondering about that. Cause on your website, you have a lot of models. It's it's a range of prices too. I don't typically see that. That's not true. I think I think Nick's offers sure. that that same uh, the blonde welted type as well, right? Like it, it's like a more affordable version because they they have their heritage line like this stuff, but then right. they have, they also have their general like factory work line. At this moment, they don't have anything that compares um, in at price point of our Patriot, but everything else is on par. Yeah. Okay. And that was sort of segueing me into another question I had. So you have a lot of builds. What would you consider to be like the Frank's like flagship model, like the one boot model that represents your brand? Well, you know, I, again, me with the, the work side of the business that I love so much, it would be my type one commander. It is the workhorse of the industry as, as far as I'm concerned. It's built with a one inch thick sole system. It's rebuildable, resolable. We, we do a McKay stitch on the inside. It's not a welted boot because I like to keep it clean and dry. Okay. Uh, my most popular last would be my 55 last or my or my 1977 last. The 77 last is a little, has a little more toe sprung to it. It's a really comfortable last. Um, so my commander probably is number one. Uh, as far as our our flagship boot okay and when you say 55 i assume it's it's the same last that nicks uses that is uh, okay that whites uses is the yeah. uh, i think these are both 55s mm -hmm. yep. yeah the 55 that we all use is is the same 55 dimensions are all the same there's nothing different about it so on our 55 our models are the front range and the wilshire but we just came out with a, a Rainier boot. So it's the 55, but you can put a crepe sole on it. So you get the comfort of the crepe sole with the high arch, which is Ooh. pretty pretty awesome. It's kind of served a, a nice little niche in there. Yeah, it's becoming one of our more popular boots that we're selling online or selling regularly, the Rainier. It's, it's, uh, it, it was a wise choice to put that one in our, in our lineup. We've gotten some great reviews from people who have gotten the 55 and there was one gentleman who had gotten into a pretty bad accident and had broken so many bones and was not comfortable, his back and his knees. And just, he said a few days in the Rainier just have really made a world of difference. And it's stories like that. I, I, you yeah. just never get tired of hearing that. And it's, it definitely I mean, makes it worthwhile to get up in the morning. Yeah, I mean, you're making people's lives better. You're improving, literally, like, dramatically improving their quality of life, which is another reason why I do this. It's like, yeah, I'm excited about this because my life is literally better with good boots. Like, it's not a materialistic thing. Like, I'm healthier because, <laughs> you know, I'm more uh, energy for, like, my family. And, to you know, I could stand in, in my mini leather workshop for eight hours on my feet if I have good leather shoes and I could be, you know, working on bags or whatever I'm doing, you know, like yeah, it, I'd love to see a tour of your shop. Do you have it on your Instagram? Um, uh, no, but it is just this. I could actually take you around right now if, you, if you're interested. <laughs> it's just, it. it's literally just my downstairs. Um, yeah, here, let me get the light here. I just got a fancy new super bright ceiling light, but, uh, this is it. <laughs> That's quite the collection you have there. Thank you. Yeah. So wow. This is uh, this is one of my bag designs. It's called I call that the expedition pack. I don't know. Oh, nice. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I have I have two primary bag models, but yeah, I mean, my shop is just literally this is my work desk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. It's all you need. It's all yeah yeah. That's that's pretty much it. And then uh. Yeah, I have more boots over here, just for. I hope yeah. you saved a space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Use of some of the space. That's for sure. I got a Wyatt Gilmore here. 
th this is a leather apron that I that I made for myself. Uh, yeah, just you know, I'm a hobbyist. I don't claim to be a professional by any stretch, but I just love it. I, I can't get enough of it. And basically, during the last three years, I, I figured I probably need a an, an apocalypse hobby, you know, or like an apoc like a trade. Like, <laughs> As the world's over, right? You have to have like you know the guy that makes I don't know raises the livestock that grows the vegetables, and then I'll be the leather guy, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got quite the following. Oh, thank you. And you know, I, I uh, when people like Mario, who what, owns 110 pairs of bespoke boots, and uh, you yeah. know talks about you, and oh, he's a great guy. Got to get to know him, and yeah. you know, well, it's. Yeah, lots of people know who you are, and Michael oh, awesome. has said nothing but wonderful things about you. So, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Well, I just, you know, I'm. It's just my pleasure to get to meet people like you and and spread the love and the joy of the hobby that and, and keep the interest alive. That's that's part of my goal is I want to keep the interest alive and you know bespoke makers, small make small batch makers. That's that's where the sweet spot is in my opinion. You know, once you start to scale out, it that's when you lose control of. Not just the quality, but the 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 soul of the industry. Ah, no pun guys, intended. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> but I think you guys truly have that soul, and that's why I was so excited to talk to you guys because you, you not just have Franks, but you also have that same DNA from Nicks and Whites. I was reading that. Uh, so your your brother Nick, he's the one who actually bought nicks right yeah so it was my mother my brother and i i was a silent partner for a while um okay. my, my brother was out here in washington we were from the we're all from the east coast but he was living in washington he okay. purchased Nick's boots with my with help with from my mother and myself i was going to be silent i didn't i wasn't going to come out to spokane and then he started changing things and growing nick's boots so he talked us into moving to Spokane. So I packed up Michelle, my daughter, and my mother, and I drove out and they flew out. And that was back in 19, the beginning of 92. Wow. And, uh, we never looked back. That's yeah, he, he did a lot of travel uh, for Nick's. At the time, his brother pretty much was stationed in, you know, just growing the business from within. And then he I was on would, the road. Yeah, he was on the road. Okay. Like, just, I mean, pretty much every month he had some sort of a trip or he was running out to a wildland fire. And back then there wasn't the internet to grow your business. So he was going and making contacts in different cities and states and finding dealers and just kind of getting the name out there. So it's, it was a lot different of a world back then. So you were the internet before the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I invented the internet. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Well, that's awesome. We're old enough to. That's oh, yeah. Well, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it was my mother, my brother, and I all the way up until 97, 98, yes. where my, okay. my brother is very smart, um, very intelligent, and he's like me, works with his hands. He's a problem solver. And my mother took care of the books. It was always a, a little bit of a struggle getting her to spend money but um, <laughs> my brother and I were growing the company. Uh -huh. yeah. and he is less of a people person than I am if you want to call me that's a such a person. nice way to say that about your brother <laughs> so after about seven years he, he he wanted out of the business so he found a buyer his name was Richard Hosley and okay. Richard came in and bought the whole company I stayed on as general manager, and then he very quickly realized that we were a good team. He wanted to handle the financial side of the business. He wanted me as part owner and general manager, and then we had a shop for him. And, and so from 98 through 2013, we were partners. And then the only reason I sold my portion of Nick's is because I thought I had been, just thought I had done it long enough and yeah. he wanted to retire he's about 12 or 13 years older than me so he wanted to retire and okay. i could have i had first right to to buy his options i mean his shares but um i thought that it would probably be best if somebody else took it to the next level so i stayed on as the new owner's general manager for two and a half years and here we are now 
So that's the whole story. Wow. So cool. And, you know, like reading the progression. So you bought Nick's from Nick. I'm going to butcher the name. No, actually, yeah. his name is Nick Blahushin. He was the original founder of Nick's Boots back in 1964. He used to work at White's Boots. Okay. He left White's and started Nick's Boots in 1964. Now, somewhere in that time frame, and I don't know what year, there was another owner. His name is Gary Myers. He was also a White's bootmaker. Him, okay. his son, his nephew, and they were they were growing Nick's boots and doing a really good job. But Gary Myers decided to sell in 1991. And the truth is, we were just sitting at a restaurant reading a newspaper, and this it's called the Nickel Nick. And in the Nickel Nick, it said there's a company called Nick's Boots for sale. My brother's name is Nick, so he said, let's go take a look at it. What Nick, my mother and I went down, looked at the company, and again, the rest is history. So there was it goes starts with Nick Blahushin, then Gary Myers, then the Petrillis, then Dick Hosley and the Petrilli. Me. Okay, okay, wow. And little did you know you guys were in the process of making history right there. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> West. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the I, I will always say this, the credit of the handmade boot world in the Pacific Northwest is is the start of it is given to White's Boots. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Otto White started it, Skip Marsh took it over and grew it. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he grew that company and did a fantastic job. They built a great boot. Uh, we wouldn't be here without that. Yeah, them. so the Nick spawned yeah. off of White's and I spawned off of Nick's. So. Wow. That is so cool. And you, you know, it's, you know, why I think it's commendable is because you guys have kept the integrity and the spirit of the, of your builds consistent with one another. You know, it, it's unmistakable when you look at this, it, mm -hmm. you know what you're seeing. It's a Pacific Northwest, no question. Of, this isn't built anywhere else. You know what I mean? Um, right. And so like when Mike Smith visited me, you know, a few months ago, he showed me the Franks and I'm like, those could be whites, those could be Nicks. And one thing that I kind of wanted to pick your brain, because, you know, just dipping my toes in this arena ever so lightly, I'm starting to sort of get like, get a sense of like the dynamic and the tension. So well, I don't want to call it tension, but like, I noticed that, you know, when I, when I interview makers, they, they like me as the consumer. When I, when I started making my own stuff, it, it was kind of like, they didn't quite know how to take it. They're like, I liked you as the as the consumer, not so much as the a fellow maker, so to speak. So I wanted to ask you, like, how do you personally deal, view and deal with competition among your peers? Like, do you see them as family? Because I, I don't think you see them as like competition, like, oh, we need to run them out of town. I think you see them more as family. And, and that's what I kind of want to frame it in my mind too like i, I want to still see all these makers as family you know i don't want to see them as competition but that's just me anyways uh, it depends yeah well it, let, me, let me say this everybody in the pacific northwest the companies that are every everybody builds a great boot. Absolutely. Um, i believe that there is there are enough customers for all of us right mm -hmm. all of us have our little niches that we cater to and then we all kind of are in the same arena as as far as the customer base and i think it's great that the customer has a choice. choice yeah without choices um the customer is at a disadvantage so the education process and the differences between the two that can be really tough when somebody is trying to decide who to buy from and we always say yeah. well, you know you should buy on buy from who you feel the most comfortable absolutely with. Um, because yeah. at the end of the day you're still going to get a good boot from no matter who it is so so yeah. buy now as far as competition goes i'm the old school guy some newer younger people are running some of the the other companies i like it and i liked it when years ago if we ran out of a five gallon pail of glue i could call one of the other companies or the other companies say, Hey, I'm out. Can you help me out? And right. it was like, yeah, cool. some of that has, let's just say with tensions has changed and, and it might okay. not be as the way it was back then, but right. 
if any of them called me needing something, I would, you know, I'd be happy to just replace it when you can, if I have enough to give to you. So I think, I think competitors should help competitors. Um, I will send people, there's certain styles of boots I don't build. Um, I don't, customers walk in the door and say, do you build this? No, I don't, but White stuff or Nick stuff. I'll send them because it's not about that one sale. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to tell the customer what he can get you know, where he can get what he wants. I'm not going to try and talk him into something else. That's what he's looking for. So that's what, where we'll send him. I just feel that that's the way it should be. And I've always been that way. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that builds karma over time. When, when you show mm -hmm. respect to a competitor without asking anything in, re in return, the ball's in their court. They could either reciprocate yeah. or be stingy and selfish and just tr try to keep hogging the business. And, and I think that, uh, acts of of kindness like that especially ones without an, any anticipation of any reward mm -hmm. in, in exchange i think those are some of the most powerful gestures we can make in a business sense because it's like no it, it shows that you truly harbor no ill will and that you know you're acting in good faith and it, you're doing right ethically by the customer and by the by the competitor by honoring the customer's wishes you know and so I, I think that's awesome. And let me say that, that just even recently within the past month, I have gotten referrals from some of the other companies yeah, to me it works, because it they, works in the other direction. maybe they, that's they, awesome. they know I'm just crazy enough to dive into some of these difficult custom fits. But one of them was that they, they didn't feel that they wanted to, to approach or, or, you know, dive into this extensive of a fit for this customer so he's, they sent him to us so i think that Ooh. maybe it's starting to change and becoming a little more friendly uh, but there was a little yeah. tension there for a while yeah I, I could see that you know it's natural i think you know and and i see this on social media all the time there's so much competition oh trying to be get the most views be the most popular and where that stuff is important like i think it's important too that we become better if there's a challenger and a competitor, you know, we, we become better creators all, all the way around. It, it keeps us honest and it keeps us on our A game and it keeps us at the, at the, at the precipice of, of the boundary, pushing our boundaries and, and creating and staying original, staying consistent. I'm, I'm so happy when, uh, when I see other creators, for example, becoming successful because it's like good, because if they're successful, then that success is going to bleed over to me one way or another because it's creating more enthusiasm around this subject. Because before, you know, five years ago, there was nobody really talking about any of this stuff, you know, and it was a shame. And I was, I was boring, you know, my family and my wife to tears. They didn't want to hear about, me, you know, <laughs> Oh, I bored her for, for 28 <laughs> years at the dinner table. And, oh, wow. and, uh, and, she finally get, jumped in and got interested in the company. So 28 years, she had to listen to my, my boot shop stories. Yeah, but it kind of came in handy because, yeah. you know, when I came on board, I wasn't coming in completely uneducated. I, I did remember a lot of his boot spiels. And for me, uh, leaving the education workplace, I, I was in education for 18 years. And it, it was definitely a huge learning curve for me as far as trying to delve into social media. I mean, mm -hmm. I barely knew how to post my own things uh, on Facebook. So getting into that was a little bit of a challenge. I'm not a photographer or videographer. You know, I do all the social media and answer all the questions and engage on our community. So it, it was, that was all brand new to me, but I feel like I don't ever want to lose that because that is that little bit of personal touch mm -hmm. that I get to have and share with my customer. And we do have our children involved in it a little bit. They have their own lives and careers, but my daughter helps with our website. She actually built the website and yeah. we're, we're going to be changing Ooh. it and she's going to help us with that. And my son also helped with the website and he's my tech guy because he, uh, you know, and he hosts our website. He hosts our website for us. And so we have, we have, family helping us through the because the old guy doesn't know how to turn a computer on so <laughs> frank you've been on this journey for decades and and you know that you just can't put it down and that's i that, this is what i see myself doing in you know 50 years i see myself just twiddling away at this stuff you know making making stuff you know with my hands it's 
It's what I love. And, and I feel like you guys are a good example of what all of us leather fiends could evolve into. You know, a healthy relationship. You guys support each other. And I think that's that's super awesome and super important. One of the things that I learned early on, and it was from Nikolai Blahushin, because when we bought Nick's boots, he, he was still making boots out of his garage for his friends and things like that. And he would come and get materials from us. And then he would do some training with me and my brother and give us some of the old school knowledge. And every time he left, he'd always tell us to be humble because you can learn something new in this business every day, no matter yes. how many years you've been in it. Yes. And mm -hmm. like I said, I know a little bit and a lot in it, but my team knows more than I do in a lot of areas. So I'm, st I still learn every, every single day. There's something yeah. and then I'll forget yeah. something and I have to relearn it. So that's uh, the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. It really yeah, does. The struggle, especially, the struggle is real. Especially yeah, after 29, <laughs> eight, nine years of doing this, you do, you do forget things and you have to retrain yourself. Yeah, it's easy to forget, you know, and it's easy to make really dumb mistakes still, you know, just the other day I'm skiving, skiving my belt, you know, I'm trying to put relief cuts on the other side and I skived a big hole straight through it. I'm like, well, I can't use that one now. Yeah. You have to be humble because if not, it will humble you. Oh this gosh. Will... Well said. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> well, if you're ever in the Spokane area, oh, I yeah. hope you will just drop in. I mean, yeah. You, honestly, uh, the only reason why we'd like a heads up is just because yeah. yeah. we can plan to have more time to spend yeah. with yeah. you. But bring your wife, come and you know, do a little tour and she'll make me clean my desk. <laughs> <laughs> no cleaning necessary. That's why she wants the heads up. So I clean my desk. <laughs> Well, there's boots all, i mean there's yeah. at least eight pairs of boots on his desk it's organized yeah. chaos yeah yeah it's his organized chaos so in other words your office is this office pretty much yeah, <laughs> yeah. except they're not in nice neat cubbies oh okay got you. right right yeah. <laughs> i do like that I'll oh have, thank you i'll message you later about that yeah i'll send you the link it, the, yeah they're, please they're, yeah i got they're called tom care cubbies on i just got them on amazon and I only put them up like this because Nick from Stridewise came to, we did a video here and he wanted to show how insane I am with all these boots and uh, <laughs> I put them on display just for him. So. <laughs> but yeah, cool. guys, this has been the best talk. Thank you so much for taking That's time out of your day. crazy schedule for, to, you know, to talk to me. I had a blast getting to meet you guys and pick That's your, for me. yeah, it, it means the world to me. So Thank you so much again. This is this has been amazing, and I definitely look forward to visiting you guys out there on the uh, on the West Coast here one of these days. Yes. The only thing that I was curious is just because uh, you run a lot of nice Seidel and Horween leathers. Yes. What's what's kind of like your favorite leather to work with? Like what what get, like right now? Like what gets you most excited? To, like what leather specifically are you like? Oh. Yeah, let's build a boot out of this. Here here's me, black. Yeah. Yeah. Seidel seven and a half eight ounce leather because it's the most forgiving you know I mean it is right. I love all of it I do there isn't any of the leather that I dislike I think that Michelle can answer the question on what she thinks is is really producing some of the most beautiful boots because we've had a lot of those come through lately and I like them all so I can't pick one but I think Michelle could probably pick one or two you know his yeah. tried and true boot is um the Riker which is part canvas oh and yeah that's, that's his absolute go-to boot let me talk about that yeah, a little bit please. so yeah. if you have a few more seconds the Riker boot yeah. um it takes us a little bit longer to build so it's, it's lead a little, times are a little yeah, longer little, lead times are a little longer but I was a skeptic I did not want to do a canvas boot okay um, again these guys went around me they started to see canvas coming in the door and I'm, I'm what is this so we <laughs> built one and as I said if you're going to build one you're going to build it in my size so we built a it's to just, just a our, prototype. it's a yeah. prototype it's we we now have a name for it. it's called the Riker but we had a we called it the it's a front range with a canvas top on it so okay. I we built the boot it's in green I looked at it and and I said okay it's it's okay then we needed somebody to test it 
and I had a lot of people who were volunteering that I said, I'm going to do it myself. I put it on last October, this time of year, when I was heading to Texas, I broke it in down in Texas and okay. um, I've never looked back. On Honestly, it. the canvas boot is, is something that um, really amazed me. I, I still wear it every day. It gives you support around the ankle, the leg, at the same time as you get the support around the foot of with the leather, because I did a mocha bottom on it. Okay. And it gives you all the ankle support you need, and it's a slight bit lighter. Okay. So it, okay. to me, it has be, I'm going to build another one in another color, because it, to yeah. me, it's, um, it's so far been a very, very um, successful yeah. I put a year into it so I can do a review on it a year later. Yeah, I think that'd be wise. Uh, yeah. 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 I, we've had some leathers come through, like when I brought in Predator Steel. Yeah. He and it was that gray. He was like, oh my gosh, I think I need a boot in that color. So of course one goes through production. It it doesn't even have 10 minutes in it. Uh then uh um, because it's on display. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. And then uh Predator Whiskey came in. And he's like, oh, I like that. That's like an old bomber jacket. I got to have yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, it's on display. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say my favorite leather right at the very moment has got to yeah. be my Marion Horsehide. It is yeah. absolutely spectacular. Next to that, I would say probably the Wicked and Craig Latigos. We have uh, brown, chestnut, and tan, and they are just superb. I, everything that comes out just looks amazing. I like the Wigan and Craig harnesses. Um, just uh, ordered the new English Bridal Cobalt by Wigan and Craig, which okay. I think is going to be pretty phenomenal. Try to bring in some different colors, uh, yeah. cobalts and greens and things like that, which, you know, he's like, nobody's ever going to buy a green boot. But there's uh, people who... Can't believe how many Royal Commanders we have sold. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. olive yeah. harness, yeah, hands down. Yeah. I, I am a green boot fiend. Uh, these are Aldens and green suede. These are... like it. Yeah, yeah. Olive wax flesh. Um, yeah, yeah. I like the olive wax flesh, too. We do have a few yeah. boots in design right now. So th this being the beginning of October, I would uh, say, you know, mm -hmm. keep your eyes open in January, and February. Well, yeah, winter. Yeah, for some new boot designs. Uh, some requests, requests that we were, um, we've were we been asked for a lot. So we're going to have those come come through. Oh, very cool. Three, actually. Three new models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Three new models. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And we just came out with, uh, I posted yesterday, I'll probably post a little different variation today. It's uh, pretty much the commander, but it's got a belt that rolls over the front of the laces. And then it's got a shifter patch on the left side. So we're calling it the road commander. It's a great motorcycle boot. Yeah, fantastic motorcycle boot. So it can be done with a, you know, lug sole or it can be done even on a wedge sole. So Wow. It's that, that's uh, our newest, but that wasn't really a new model. It was really just kind of a variation right. thereof. Modification on on a pre-existing model. Okay. Yeah. Those, those commanders, I see you guys do them in a, in a few different kinds. That's why when I did my original video, I was trying to zero in on exactly what it was. And, you know, it seems to be a, a taller plain toe with a with a sprung toe on your what was that the 77 last 77 yeah yeah okay yeah yeah that they're all the year we met. And I, I named that after the yeah. year we met oh no kidding oh that is awesome yeah that just uh, ages us <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> thanks for having us Dale. absolutely thank have you have a guys. wonderful a afternoon yes, yes. You call anytime if you ever have any questions be happy to talk to you our door is our door and our phone is always open so um if you have any questions oh, wow. or you need any information if you're trying to you know do anything else like you're designing of your false tongues or you want to get into something else just give us a call yeah please yeah do.